Hello, uh, welcome back. Okay, I see more people coming. So um, this week, uh, so on Thursday, we're gonna have our, uh, have the second midterm exam. And today we will uh, start a new uh, chapter on graph algorithms. So in this new chapter, there are actually quite a lot of content to cover. So uh, in this part one, we will um, have the basic uh, representation techniques, like how do we represent a graph with data structures and uh, we will cover uh, two types of elementary uh, search algorithms in graph. And then we'll give uh, two examples of how uh, the search algorithms are applied to solve uh, more practical problems. So the plan is to use uh, the lecture today and the two lectures next week to cover the elementary graph algorithms, okay? And we will probably spend some time on the um, assign on the on the second midterm after it is done. We will talk about the solutions, talk about the questions in it. Okay. So the second midterm will be on Thursday afternoon, and it will be in a similar form as the first midterm. All right. So let's get started on the graph algorithms. Okay, so this is um, a type of um, problems or a topic in computer science that actually uh, covers quite broad range of problems. Like in hardware design, if we want to design a circuit network, then in the software that automatically does the circling for a designer, then uh, the, uh, that does the automatic, uh, what, what is called automatic uh, wiring stuff for circuit design, then it's uh, graph-based algorithms applied. And the internet we use so much, so often, actually the data packets that transfer transforms uh, transports between um, network exchangers, routers, servers, they are actually uh, guided by well-designed graph algorithms, social networks, and even, even in uh, AI in uh, say natural language processing, we need to represent uh, the data, our knowledge base with graph data structure. We need to represent the uh, word meanings, for example, the different meanings of words are organized in the uh, graph, like graph-based data structure. So graph is so, uh, so, so commonly used uh, in computer science and it is a um, must to know and at least to know it. And then we need to represent the basic, we need to have an idea of what the basic algorithms are involved in the graph data structure, okay? All right, so in order to represent a graph in computer, so first of all, it is a kind of a data structure. So, you know, we are, we've all, we are already very familiar with arrays, right? With, uh, it's basically a one-dimensional vector. Arrays and trees, we have some ideas of what a tree look like, binary trees, and uh, heap data structure, right? And the heap is also stored in an array, but the pa parents and child relationship can be computed in a heap, right? So all these are data structures. And uh, the graph is no more than a new type of algorithm, uh, a new type of data structure, but this data structure is not like the trees that we used before, okay? So it's more of a kind of uh, um, have a complete circle, have a complete cycle, okay? So we need to use three elements 
at least three elements like the vertices, edges, and weights, okay, to represent a graph, okay. And basically, we uh, a graph should support basic search algorithms like the breadth first search and depth first search that we're gonna cover, uh, hopefully within three lectures. And then we'll talk about talk more about the more uh, advanced algorithms. Like if we uh, take into account of the weights on the edges, then we will basically uh, think about questions like how to get the minimum uh, spanning trees of the graph. Like how do we uh, connect all the vertices in the graph with the minimal cost we want to travel as, as uh, less distance as possible. Questions sort of like that. And also a common practice, a common application of graph algorithms is to is a path finding problem. We want to, given a graph, given a, say if we represent a map, with a graph data structure, then we can find the shortest path between any vertices uh, selected upon a map. So that is a very uh, typical question, a typical problem that we actually, we use our map uh, applications on our, on our smartphone every day, right? We given to the destination, given the source, we need to, we want the, the algorithm to run fast to calculate the shortest path, okay? So, and these are the type of um, the pathway we're gonna go through uh, to cover the graph-based algorithms. So uh, I see a question. So basically we are not going to do a review today. So I'm gonna, uh, everything is available in the video that I uploaded and uh, I would not have any more uh, slides to cover to talk about the, uh, to talk about the midterm, second midterm. In, in this lecture. All right. So we will first look at the representations of graphs, right? It's a data structure. So we need to uh, know how to represent it. Okay. And then we have a, we will also, if we have time, we maybe talk about the BFS today at least and DFS, we may leave it to the second lecture. Okay, so we'll need to introduce some, a bunch of new uh, notations. We use capital letter G to represent the graph and it consists of a set of vertices. So we use the capital letter V to indicate the set that the set of all the vertices, okay? And the third capital letter E to represent the set of all edges, okay? So an edge in a graph, it connects a pair of vertices, okay? So an, an edge is a line and at the, at the two ends of the line are two vertices, okay? So in short, we can write G equals parenthesis V comma E to indicate, okay, so this is a graph. And in this graph G, we have the set of vertex V and the set of edges E. Okay, so in the, this is a uh, very simple example of, the, of a graph, okay? So if you look at the circles, the nodes with numbers in it, these are the vertices with one, two, three, four, five, five vertices, five vertices, okay? And also the lines with the letters, lowercase letters on top of it or beside it are the edges we have are uh, basically seven edges from A to G, okay? And since the V and E are set, are sets, right? So we can use the size of the sets. Like we put two bars between V. So the size of V is the number of vertices and the size of E is the number of edges, okay? So these aren't just, uh, the notations that will be used across the whole uh, uh, chapter. Okay, so here's then here comes an interesting relationship. So 
the size of E, which is the total number of edges, should be lower than or equal to the size of V, the square, the square of uh, size of V, size of V raised to the power two. So that is a very interesting relationship. So if we think about why this is the case, then we got to start from the nature of the edge, right? For an edge, we need to decide like the two sides, the two ends of an edge, right? So how many choices are there for the left end? Because we have V, the size of V, that many nodes, uh, that many of vertices, right? So that's the number of choices for the left end. And for the right end, we also have that many of uh, vertices, okay? So in this case, we consider an edge can start from one vertex and going back to the vertex itself, okay? So if that edge, which is a circle, points from the vertex and back to itself, it's also an edge. So V times V is the theoretical upper limit of the total number of edges. We can never go beyond that number. Right, because we only have that many possible vertices to choose from, okay? So this is a quite uh, um, um, interesting relationship, okay? So we can basically use this, the relative uh, number of edges to describe an, uh, a, a graph, okay? So if there are a lot of uh, edges, then that means most of the vertices in the graph are interconnected. And then we can say, this is a very, uh, probably a very dense graph. And then if there are much fewer edges than the number of vertices, then that means a lot of the vertices, they are, they are isolated, they are not connected. So that in that case, this is a quite uh, sparse uh, graph, okay? So in this case, we can write the number of vertices as this, as uh, the V between two bars and the E between two bars as the number of edges, okay? Then we have this uh, uh, difference between directed and I -direct, uh, undirected graphs, okay? It's a simple uh, uh, difference as the directed graphs have directions on the edges. So the edges, they are actually arrows, okay? So you see now we have two lines, two edges between the vertex two and vertex four, okay? So this is important because the edge that points from two to four is different, is a different edge as the edge pointed from four to two. Okay, because the edge has directions. Okay, the edges with different directions, even though their two ends are the same, then they are considered as two edges. Okay. And edges that do not have directions, in, in that case, the then we call it an undirected graph simply, right? So in this case, we cannot draw like two edges between uh, two and four or four and five because it's um, undirectional, undirected graphs, okay? We don't have, we should not have duplicates of edges in this case, okay? And further, let's look at the weighted graphs, okay? So it's, uh, the definition is that uh, each edge comes with an associated weight, okay? So it's typically given by a weight function, okay? We should uh, assign each edge and real number, okay? It could be an integer number, it could be a real number, okay? It could be even be a, a negative numbers, okay? So in this case, in this undirected graph, we have the numbers associated to each edge. And intuitively, right, if we think of this edge as kind of a map, right, then the weights on each edge 
it intuitively it indicates some kind of distance, right? It kind of like the if the one, two, three, four, five, the vertices, they are cities, then it probably indicates that, okay, the distance between two and city two and city three are 11 miles, okay? Or it, it could be the traveling time as well, okay? And the interesting uh, case for the weighted graphs is that the graphs can have negative values, okay? And we will see that in the case of negative values that exists, then the graphs will represent quite a lot of interesting properties. Okay, so but here we just uh, let's go through all the basic basics for representing graphs. Okay, so so far we have uh, introduced the uh, basic notations, the different types of graphs uh, using. Direction, direction or undirection graphs, weights, vertices, all these basics. And then now let's uh, look at in a real computer, how the edges are, um, how the graphs are created and stored in a computer memory, okay? So we typically have two standard ways to represent a graph, okay? So either we can, the first way is called a adjacency list. Okay, adjacency lists. So pay attention to the plural fonts. That means we have multiple lists, okay? Not just the one list, okay? So it's a collection of adjacency lists or we use adjacency matrix, okay? Or we put everything in one matrix and we'll see uh, in practice, we'll use the first option more more often more often than the adjacent matrix. But uh, it's it's good to know that there are different two ways to represent a graph. So, for adjacency lists, the first method is, is more commonly used for sparse graph, but for adjacency matrix, it is commonly used for dense graph. Okay, so like I have already mentioned that a bit in two slides before the the, the sparse the sparse graph here it basically indicates the graph that has that don't have that many of edges okay so in that graph in a sparse graph a lot of the vertices they are not connected and the number of edges are relatively small compared to the number of vertices and in the other case in the dense graph then there a lot of more uh, edges and most of the vertices, they are actually connected. Okay. And then let's look at, first look at the adjacency lists. Okay. So I'm showing here with these charts. Okay. Uh, this is one adjacency list. Okay. It's a list data structure. Okay. and in the graph, because um, it has uh, the size of V vertices, then we should have the same number of adjacency lists, one for each vertex in V, okay? So for example, these adjacency list is the adjacency list for the vertex T and T is a vertex in the graph G, okay? So we will use the, the short form ADJ to indicate one adjacency list, okay? And we should have size of V that many uh, lists in total in that graph, okay? So for each vertex, the Adjacency, let's look at what the adjacency list contains, okay? So for the vertex U, then the adjacency list ADJ of U, okay? So this is a list. This list should contain all the vertices V such that there is an edge 
exists in a graph. Okay. So, or in another way, the if we choose the vertex U as our target vertex, then the adjacency list ADJ of U should contain all the vertices that connect to U. Okay, so if there's an edge between V and U, then we should include V into this adjacency list. Okay. All right. So, or in other words, we are actually counting, including all adjacent vertices in U. Okay. Um, let's look at this uh, simple example here. And we're looking at a undirected uh, graph that have five um, uh, vertices. Okay. So, Let's look at the ADJ property attributes of G. So this ADJ itself is an array, okay? And each element of the array, of the ADJ array is a list. So the first element here is the adjacency list for the vertex one, okay? Because there is one edge between one and two and an edge between one and five. So the element, the vertex two and five will exist in the first adjacency list, right? And if we look at the second element, it is the adjacency list for the vertex two, okay? Because we have one, two, three, four, four edges that connect to the vertex two. So all the adjacency vertex one, five, three, and four are included in the adjacency list, okay? So that is the uh, adjacency list representation for this uh, undirected graph, okay? And if you look at a directed graph, okay? From the figure, you will see that it's much uh, less uh, elements here. If you look at, um, the vertex one, right? Then it has two edges from one that starts from one, which is edge from one to two and edge from one to four. Okay, so the two and four are included in the adjacent list for vertex one, okay? But here now we need to pay attention to the definition. So it should, the, the adjacent list contains all the vertices such that there is an edge from U to V, okay? So now we are looking at a directed graph. So now if we turn to the vertex two, then how many edges are there that starts from two and lead to somewhere else? There's only one edge from two to five, right? So there's only one element, there's only one vertex in the adjacency list for vertex two, okay? Because all the other two edges, let me use another color. All the other two edges here, they are connected to two, but they don't start from two, okay? By the definition of the adjacency list, we only consider the uh, edges that um, start from the current vertex, okay? So, we may soon compare it with the undirected graph, then the undirected graph, for the, the, the adjacency list is much larger, right? Because basically all edges are counted twice, right? So this edge is counted when we use one as the current vertex. And it's also counted again when we consider two, right? So that's why the adjacency list here is much larger. Okay. So that's one way of representing uh, the graphs in memory, which is adjacency lists. Okay, so let's look at a few properties for adjacency lists, okay? So if G first, if G, the graph is a directed graph, 
okay, as indicated by the right graph, then the summation, the sum of lengths of all adjacency lists is the number of edges. All right, let's check whether this is true, right? So the number of edges is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? And the number of uh, um, summation of lengths, let's look at summation of lengths of all adjacency lists, okay? Um, it's one, one, two. The, the first adjacent, the lens of the first uh, adjacent list is two, one, two, one, one, one. Uh, which is, okay, so we have one more edge, eight here, okay. So, the summation of the length of all the adjacency list is eight, which is the number of edges in this case, right? And right. And then if we look at the undirected graph, then the summation should double. The sum of the length of all adjacency lists should double, double the times uh, as the number of edges. Okay, because all the look at this case, so. Uh, all the edges are counted twice. That is the reason why the, the, the total sum of lengths should uh, be two times the length of edge, okay? Edge sizes. So it's two plus four plus two plus three plus three, okay? And that is one property for the adjacency lists, okay? So now, Look at, let's look at the second way of representing a uh, graph, okay? So uh, we use a matrix. So a graph, we can use the adjacent matrix to uh, represent the connections between the vertices. So this graph itself should be a V times V, okay? The, there are V rows and V columns and V is the, size, is the number of vertices. So we basically use a matrix to describe all the possible connections between all possible pairs of vertices, okay? So the elements or the entries in the uh, matrix should be either one or zero, okay? It is one only if the edge from I to J exists in the, in, in, as an edge. If the, that edge doesn't exist, then we use a zero to indicate that, okay? So in this case, uh, undirectional graph, un undirected graph, right? We see that the ones indicates there is an edge between uh, the vertex one and two, okay? As this is an undirected graph, so the matrix is actually um, asymmetric along diagonal line, right? So there's a one here, one here, and one here, one here. So it's basically very, uh, it's a cement, uh, symmetric uh, matrix representation here. And in the case of a uh, directed graph, then it is no more uh, a uh, symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, matrix. But you will see that it's uh, the matrix on the right, it's much more uh, sparse, right? Okay, so that kind of answers the question of why the adjacency matrix is more suitable for dense vectors, uh, for dense uh, um, graphs. So the graph here, uh, I wouldn't say there are too, uh, too much difference between these two graphs, but as at least on the right, this matrix shows there are a lot of zeros, okay, which is, uh, basically not a very efficient way of storing uh, integer numbers, okay? Unless you use sparse matrix techniques, but that's another, of another thing of technique, okay? So as if you have multiple, if you have more edges, then more zeros will be replaced by ones in this case. And then that means the 
matrix space is more efficiently used. Okay, so that's adjacency matrix. Okay, so now let's enter uh, the search algorithms for graphs. Okay, we'll at least cover the breast first search implementation today. Okay, so why do we need to search in the graph? Okay, um, I don't think, um, I think it's a quite straightforward, quite straightforward uh, question because uh, given the graph, if it represents some important information, we basically want to uh, first know the, have an estimates of how many vertices are there and what's their relationship, like how far away these vertices are from each other. And so in order to have that information, we need to at least go through the graph according to some principle, according to some rules, uh, at least we need to visit all the vertices once, okay? So a search algorithm will help us accomplish this goal, okay? So we will first uh, define the what, it, what a search uh, operation is, okay? So it means we need to follow the edges so that we can visit the vertices of the graph, okay? Each time we, we go through an edge and our goal is to visit all the vertices in a graph, okay? Then only by searching the graph, we can obtain the graph's structural information. We would have an idea of how this graph looks like, okay? And it's basically the heart of most graph algorithms, okay? It'll, it'll, we'll, we'll, we'll build a complex algorithm on top of the very basic search algorithms on graphs, okay? So we'll first look at the very basic breadth first search BFS and the depth first search DFS, okay? The breadth first search. So as the name indicates, we will prefer go as broad as possible, okay? So given the graph and in order to search the graph, we need to start somewhere. So we will start at the source vertex S. So we call it a source, that's where we start. The BFS will systematically explore the edges to discover every vertex that is reachable from S, okay? So for example, S is here and it's connected to say multiple uh, other vertices. Then the base, the, the BFS basically says that I want to visit all the neighboring or all the uh, vertices that are reachable from S, okay? We'll cover these, the, the vertices of the same breadth first, and then we'll go deep. So we will not go as deep as possible, but we will cover the um, vertices that are the same within the same distance, within the same distance uh, from, the, from the source vertex S, okay? So what it does is to compute the distance from S to each reachable vertex, it, it is what it accomplishes. The, the algorithm will compute the distance from S to all to each reachable vertex. So here the distance, okay, is um, uh, uh, indicate the, the, the distance is defined by the smallest the number of edges, okay? So we don't want to uh, confuse with the, the weights, okay, of the edges. We, in, in, here we are not, uh, talking about the weights of uh, edges yet. We are simply use the number of edges, okay? Like if there are two edges that is from S to V, then we say the distance between S and V is two, okay? So that is our definition for the distance, not the weights on the, on the edge, okay? So the BFS search, BFS will can, uh, produce some data structure called breadth first tree, okay? Um, 
we may have some, uh, you may have already heard of the, the, the term BFS tree uh, before, okay? So because BFS is also a search algorithm for a tree structure, okay? Uh, but this time the BFS tree returned with the root node, the root node S is something that records the distance between S and any reachable vertex in the graph, okay? So the vertex V that is reachable, if it's reachable from S, then the simple path in the tree from S to V. So S is in top, on top, it is the root node. And the V is any vertex that is below the tree. Then any simple path from S to V, it basically represents the shortest path from S to V, okay? The shortest path in the graph from S to V. And that's shortest, the, the concept of shortest is also defined on top of the number of edges, not on the weights, okay? So here we're not considering weights, okay? All right, uh, the principle for breast first algorithm is that it will discover all the vertices at distance k, okay, from S before discovering any further vertices, okay? So all the vertices that are within k distance from S will be all discovered before any vertices that are k plus one distance away. That is the principle of breast first. Okay, we will search the near, most nearby vertices first until there are no new vertices within this most nearby distance. Then we will go for uh, one step further. That is the basic uh, principle. Okay, now let's look at the implementation for BFS search. Okay, so we will need to define uh, three types of vertices. Uh, when we implement BFS. And we will use the color, okay, to define them. So we, the, the BFS algorithm will cover each vertex with either white or gray or black, okay? So all the vertices are initially white, okay? So white means that they are not discovered, okay? but a vertex will become non-white, either gray or black, when the first time it is discovered, okay? So all the vertices are white, start out white, but once a vertex is discovered, then it is no longer white, okay? The, so that means the gray and black vertices are already discovered, okay? So what's the difference between gray and black? The gray vertices, it can have adjacent white vertices, okay? So it, the gray, gray ones, the gray vertices are kind of those on the boundary, okay? It may connect to adjacent white vertices, but all the vertices that are adjacent, adjacent to a black vertices are discovered. Okay, so the black ones, it is the, the ones that we are most familiar with. The black ones are those connect to, connect to no uh, nodes that are not discovered. Okay, so it is in the more in the interior side, in a, in a more interior area, but the grays are on the boundary and the whites areas are those not uh, discovered yet, okay? So yeah, so the gray ones are represent the frontiers. Uh, between between the discovered and the undiscovered vertices, right? Okay, so let's see uh, how the procedure should go in order to do the BFS, okay? So the roots uh, is the source vertex S. So it, it, this is a, how we construct a breast first tree because it is, a, it is a data structure that will be returned. And also the, in the tree, it contains the shortest pass information, okay? So assume a vertex U is already discovered, then we can scan its adjacency list. 
okay remember that we use adjacency list to represent a graph okay so this g dot adj it includes all the adjacency lists and g dot adj of u is a specific is a particular specific adjacency list for vertex u okay so it stores all the adjacent vertices that is that is connected to u okay so in this process in this course whenever a white vertex is discovered then we will add v and the edge to the tree okay why a white vertex is a vertex that is never uh discovered before okay and uh, that means the u is the predecessor or the parents of v okay and a vertex is discovered at most once okay so that means it has at most one parent and after a vertex is discovered we will need to paint it uh, into gray or black colors okay so we will look at the uh, procedures here okay the bfs procedure so it's a uh, quite a bit of code uh, but basically, we'll look at the, the different functions of different lines, uh, line by line, okay? So the input is the graph, right? And the source vertex, so we must have a source. We must start from somewhere, okay? And also, we assume that each vertex has attributes, color, and the distance, okay? So this distance is used to store the distance from that vertex to the source vertex, okay? And the third attribute, the dot pi, is used to, uh, to store the parents, okay? So the parents of u, okay, so this is a typo. So the parents of u should be stored in the u dot pi, okay? And let's look at the first for loop, okay? So it's a simple uh, initialization, the first four lines. It's just go through all the vertices except for the source and we'll need to set the color to white and set the distance to infinity and set the parents, set the pi to none, okay? Because we have not started yet. Everything needs to be initialized, okay? And the second, the, the next three lines, because S is where we start, okay? We are standing on S and that means S is already visited. So we need to paint it to gray and to set the distance color, set the distance value to zero, okay? Because it, the, the distance measures the distance, uh, the D measures the distance from the source and we are, it's actually source itself. So the distance is zero. And that the parent is also to nil because it is the first vertex that's discovered. Okay, we don't need to consider the parents of S. Okay, so from line one to line seven are the necessary initialization steps. Okay, and then we notice something. We define something called a Q. Okay, so this Q is a Q data structure. And the Q means first in, first out. Right, remember we have used the minimal priority Q uh as a data structure right uh, but this time we don't use uh that advanced uh data structure but we use first in a simple first in first out queue data structure and what we do is to insert the source into the queue so that is that queue is not empty okay it's ready to use Okay, so uh, the role or the function of Q is to manage or to store the set of gray vertices. That is an important role, okay? Everything, all the gray vertices is stored in Q. So initially only the S is a gray one. So we need to in Q, S to Q, okay? So now that the queue contains one source vertex, it is not empty. So that means 
the while loop in, in the rest of the functions can be executed, okay? So the condition, the ending condition for the while loop is that the, uh, the, the queue is empty, okay? So the while loop will keep iterating as long as the remain, their remaining gray vertices, okay? Now let's look at the first line, 11. It will remove the gray vertex at the head of the queue, okay? Because the, in, the, in the queue, the first in element will be first removed, okay? So in the first iteration, because there are only one vertex S, the source vertex in the, in the queue, so it will be removed, okay? So, and from line 12 to 17, we notice that there is a inner for loop within the while loop, okay? So what this for loop does is to examine the vertex that's just dequeued, okay? We dequeued, we remove one gray vertex from Q, and then we use a for loop to go through all the adjacent vertex in U, okay? Because the adjacency list G dot adjacent of U, it stores all the adjacent vertices of U, okay? So we go through all the adjacency vertices for U and we call it V, okay? And then what do we do to that uh, adjacency list, uh, to that adjacency element? is that we check whether it, if that adjacency vertex is white or not, okay? If it is white, then it means we discovered something new. It is something, it is a vertex that's never discovered, okay? And we're happy about that. So what we do is to change its color because now we discovered that it shouldn't be white anymore. Okay, so we will change its color to gray. Okay, and we will set its distance to its original distance plus one. And we will also record the parents node, the parent vertex of V to be U. Okay, that's because we discovered the vertex U first. And after U are discovered, after the vertex U is discovered, we will go through all the adjacent, adjacent vertices in, in, in U. And that means the V is discovered after U, immediately after U, right? So the U should be the uh, parents for, for V, okay? And after we update the attributes for V within these three steps, we will again put back, put the V back. Okay, it's actually not put, put it back, but it's to place it at the tail of the queue. Okay, we will just insert the V, okay? Because the V is the newly obtained gray vertices, okay? And then we have an important step, which is, after the for loop. So after all the adjacent, adjacent vertices of U is discovered, we will need to change the color of U to black, okay? Remember when U is first dequeued, it is still gray, right? Because everything in Q are gray. And the gray means that for that gray vertex, it might have, it may have white adjacent vertices, okay? But since we use a for loop to paint all the white adjacent vertices to gray, then the U should no longer be gray, but it should be black because we have made sure that there's no white neighbors. No, there's no white uh, uh, vertices anymore, okay? So that is the uh, importance that we need to keep in mind. We need to change the colors of it, okay? And 
basically we can use a loop uh, invariance to check the consistent to check the consistency or the correctness of the algorithm. So the, the loop invariant is also clear. Uh, the Q should always uh, consist of uh, the gray uh, vertices, okay? And also it's easy to check uh, because whenever a vertex is painted gray at line 14, right? We change the color uh, for V to gray, then it will be in Q. Okay, so that makes sure that all the gray vertices are in queued. And whenever a, uh, a vertex is dequeued, it will be uh, it will be eventually be painted to black. Okay, so that also means that we're, we're not missing any gray uh, any gray vertices at all. Okay. All right. So that is the uh, pseudo code for the BFS procedure. So now I think we can use a simple example to uh, to have a better sense of how the algorithm runs. Okay, so let's look at a simple graph like this. Uh, this is after the initializations are done. Okay, the circle, the, the vertices have colors, and the, since the source is S, we need to we need to paint the uh, source uh, to be uh, to be gray, and all the other vertices should be white. Okay, and the numbers within the vertex is the distance from that vertex to the source. Okay, so everything except for s are initially uh, infinity. Okay, so now let's look at the BFS, that's the initialization, okay? So after initialization, we'll just focus on the while loop, okay? The Q is initially in with just the, the S, okay? And so the S will be first dequeued, okay? So after S is dequeued, we'll now look at the adjacent vertices of S. So the R and the W, are the two adjacent vertices for S. So we will, what we will do is to paint them gray and increase their distance to be zero plus one, right? The distance of V should be the distance of U plus one and their parents should be u okay so i used this uh highlighted uh, edge to indicate the parent relationship okay so and then we will need to in q w and r okay so now w is into the q first because uh this is arbitrary i can also in q r and then w and that totally uh depends on the uh how the adjacency vertices are stored in the adjacency list, okay? But that order doesn't matter much, okay? So we'll enqueue W and R into the queue. So now the queue has two gray uh, uh, vertices. So we know keep, we'll keep running the while loop. So the next one being uh, dequeued will be W, right? The W will be dequeued. So now we need to consider that the adjacent 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 vertices for W, okay, which is T and X, okay. So we'll need to paint them gray, and also uh, increase the distance from um, to one plus one because W is their vertex is their parent vertex, and that D should be one plus one, which is two, and also they are in queued, okay. All right, so that's the first iterations, first couple iterations. And then the R will be dequeued, okay? After R is dequeued, the for loop will check the adjacent uh, vertices for R, which is S and the V, right? But since S is already black, it is already non-white, so it will be skipped. And we'll just consider V and the distance will be increased 
and it will be in queue, okay? And the parent relationship will be uh, recorded, okay? And then the T will be uh, in queued, uh, will be dequeued, and the adjacent vertex U will be updated and in queued. And then the last element is Y being in queued, okay? So, so far, the queue is not, uh, the, all the elements are visited, but the queue is not empty, right? We'll keep go through the while loop by dequeuing all the uh, elements from queue. But since all the adjacency in those gray points, they are already visited, uh, we can finally paint all the vertices to be black, okay? So now we've got something like this. Right. So now the interesting part comes if we use S as the root vertex, as the root node, then it will give us, oops, it will give us a tree. Okay. If we, if we imagine, if you take the root node S and lift up all the nodes, then all the vertices will be hanging below S. Okay. And that's, BFS tree will remember, will tell you the shortest path from each vertex to the source vertex, okay? For example, the S, the, the V here too, the, it, it tells you that the vertex V is two edges away from S, okay? The Y here is three edges away from S, okay? So one more thing I wanna, I don't want to skip is the previous slide. That's the running time. Okay. Okay. So, oops. So each vertex is in queued at most once. Why? It's it's in queued when it is gray, right? And also it is dequeued at most once. So each queue operation takes constant time. That's our assumption. We, we, we assume that the queue is implemented quite efficiently. So the total time for the queue operations is big O of V, right? Because we have V many vertices, okay? So now we need to consider the inner for loops because it's inside the while loop, okay? Um, the for loop at line 12 here, it scans the adjacency list for each vertex only when it is dequeued, okay? So that means each adjacency list is scanned only once, okay? And we need to use some knowledge about the total sum of the lengths of all the adjacency lists because we already know that the sum of the lengths for all the adjacency lists is E or two times E in the case of the undirected graph, then the total time for scanning the item, for scanning all the item in the adjacency list is big O of E, okay? That said, the total running time for the BFS algorithm should consider big O of V plus E, okay? We should consider the number of vertices and the number of edges. Uh, we should combine the two parts and then that'll be the total amount of running time, okay? And let's see if I can cover some more points here. Uh, okay, I, I'd like to talk about this slide. The BFS finds the distance to each reachable vertex in the graph, okay? So the shortest pass is defined by the minimum number of edges in any path from S to V, okay? So when there's no path, then the short, the delta shortest path is infinity, okay? So that is the term we can define and let's use the, let's look at this slide. So the shortest pass in the BFS, in, in the graph can actually be, oops, can actually be plotted 
in the shortest path in this BFS tree from the root node to the to the target node here. Okay. Um, let's see any slide left. Okay. So the there's actually a theorem to correct to 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 prove the correctness of BFS. Okay. Um, this is not required. And if you are interested to read the proof, then you can turn into that two pages and it will uh, give you a more comprehensive sense of why BFS, how BFS works, okay? So actually we can quickly print the shortest pass of a graph by assuming we have already run BFS on G, okay? So we can use this print, uh, uh, pass procedure and it will basically outputs the uh, functions out outputs the all the paths uh, along the along the source vertex and the target vertex okay so you can think about the question of what would be the results after we if we run print pass on this function okay so there's some tricky place is the uh, uh, recursive call here, right? If there's if there's no parents for the current node, then we, we can simply uh, halt, right? We, we should print there's no pass. Then if else, then we should uh, print, we should call the fun recursive function on the parents and then print the current node, okay? I'll leave this as a, as a, as a quiz question, okay? So, uh, that's it for the lecture today. And I will release the uh, quiz question later and upload the videos later. So uh, another reminder, we will have the second midterm and uh, let me know if you have questions. Yes, the meeting is at two o'clock.